Yeah, um, this, Pete Brooks. Um, I'm associate director now at Acom. I was a delivery manager at Healthy Waters, hence all the Auckland Council logoing. This is one of their projects. I am very grateful to the likes of Craig McElroy and Chris Stumbles for actually um, allowing me to present this to you today. So I'm um, have some really good stuff. Um, so let's get into it. Um, I'll give you a bit of an overview of what we're doing and why we're doing it. I will turn my camera off because otherwise I'm going to keep looking away and I don't want to do that. So just so you're aware, um, when we get to questions, I'm more than happy to turn it back on. So agenda is um, Safe Swim. What is it? Um, I'll give you a bit of background as to why these projects came about and what Safe Swim has had to do with that. I'll take you through a couple of projects. The first one is the Underworth Reserve Stormwater Pond Renewals. And for those of you not in New Zealand, we had a bit of an event here in Auckland on the 27th of January this year. I'll give you a bit of context around what that was, how it looked, what sort of levels of impact we saw and um, some photos post that event and actually how the Unsworth Reserve stood up. Um, and then same with the Titeo, I'll take you through the actual project, what we did, how we did it. Um, there's a really cool time lapse video that I'll play right the way through and I'll give you a bit of a running commentary on. Um, and again, a bit of detail around what happened um, on the 27th of January at this site. Um, yeah, just a bit of context. And then finally, discussion and questions. Um, I am, as I've already outlined, happy to take questions as we go. But um, if it gets a bit too big and disrupts what we're trying to achieve in this, an overall run of the presentation, I will just park it and come back to it at the end. Okay. So Safe Swim, what is it? Well, Safe Swim is an online product that we can actually access. Um, it provides a collaborative program, giving real-time advice on the level of risks associated with swimming at specific locations originally across Auckland, but we're actually expanding it beyond the Auckland boundary. It is a partnership between Auckland Council and a number of other regional councils, Surf Life Saving New Zealand, um, the Auckland Regional Public Health Service. Um, these are really powerful organisations that are trying to make sure people are safe and well and healthy. Um, it started out around water quality with having surf living surf life saving new zealand involved we're actually looking at what the actual risks at these beaches are now and there's some great stuff and um, what it, the really clever thing here it does is it real it combines real-time data of the performance of the weight water system and the stormwater network and these are actually using predictive modeling data to actually give us an indication of what the quarter quality of these beaches actually is and all of this is actually underpinned by regular sampling and provides a, a forecast of water swimming quality um, at a number of sites across Auckland. Um, Barbara will put a, a link in the chat around actually going to Safe Swim but overall this is what it looks like. Um, pretty straightforward site. Um, green is good, red is not. Um, post the 27th, but for quite some time now, we've had a number of beaches closed um, because of the, the, the number of storm events we've actually seen in the last few weeks. But it gives you a good overview of what we're doing and why we're doing it. So why am I telling you about this? Well, a lot of a lot of what I used to do was actually design infrastructure to actually deal with improving water quality at our beaches. Now people may think, yeah, but what's a pond or wetland got to actually do with water quality at a beach? Well, it's the natural kidneys of the environment. And um, we've spent a long time, in fact, probably the last 30, 40 years, taking a lot of this out and putting wonderfully straight concrete channels and lack of filtration and retention and what we're actually doing is starting to put this back. Some of you may have heard the phrase um, sponge city. Um, this is a part of that and it's a, a, a tool in a certain toolbox. I'll take you through a bit more detail, but that's why Safe Swim has actually helped us deliver this because this actually identified there were a number of problems across the city with a number of beaches. And actually we were able to demonstrate that if we, you know, we understand the problem, we can resolve that by actually using nature and working with nature as opposed to working against it so that that was the idea um we had some success um i think we just want to look to see where we go so started with unworth unsworth reserve um glasgow contractors i genuinely want to thank them they they've been an amazing contractor through both of these jobs in even in fact post 
the event we had a um they were actually out on site on the 28th of january checking these sites over to make sure they were safe and fit for purpose so again all thanks to Cade and Cole um, for all their support and actually doing the work. So where is Unsworth Reserve? And there's a, a reserve on the north shore of Auckland. And for those of you who don't know, Auckland has a, 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 a bridge and two harbours. This is on the northern side of that. Um, the upper harbour highway and the northern motorway are very close. Um, we're actually at a conjunction of the two. Um, what does it do? Well, they actually, the, the, the site consists of an upper pond, a middle pond, and a lower pond. This pond system was designed um, when the housing estate went in to, to try and attenuate some of the water and improve water quality. Um, was in significant need of, of some upgrade and understanding. We're actually looking to modify how this site operates and what we do and how we do it. Just so you know, the order of flow, it goes from pretty much north, um, south to north. Um, and that allows, that's the, the downhill gradient going to the coast. Of the, so the, the harbour is actually to the north of this site. So what did we do? Um, we started by desilting the actual pond, original pond. So these ponds have been in certainly since the mid late 80s. Um, not in particularly good condition. You can see on the photo on the left, we've got um, a truck saw. Um, amphibious um, desilting machine basically. So what he's got is a, a digger bucket on the front with a big hoover behind it that goes through a, a filtration system where we dewater the, the silt from the, the base of the base of the pond. Um, that is the water returns to the pond via after it's been coagulated and the silt's actually disposed of to landfill, which is something we're actually looking at using this as a product, not as a waste, but at this moment in time, because it's got potentially um, heavy metals um, in it from the likes of car brakes and the associated materials in that which has actually considered a waste so we actually have to take that to landfill as it stands but i know healthy waters are doing some work to try and address that we excavated the base of the pond once we drained it um and actually started to set out the new outline of where we wanted to do so this included making the site significantly deeper in places to allow cool water for um the ecology and the fish to actually do well um then we actually got started at the bottom of the left um i'd brought in some um, topsoil so the plants would grow um upgraded the, the the bank at the top and you can see that the pumps on the left hand side keeping the water levels down brought a significant amount of material in to actually ensure that you know the, the base of the pond was stable the plants would grow um as you can see six wheelers lined up right across the site um so going from left to right what you've got is the, the deeper patches of water actually within it with with topsoil the level of compaction in the bottom left hand corner um the photo in the middle is actually looking downstream further within the project and that's actually some stream upgrade work we did to make sure any erosion that may occur when this when the ponds actually activate so they are designed to overspill um in a, a major storm event like we did have um and the photo to the right is actually moving that that rock to ensure the protection of these banks and actually understand what we're doing while we're doing it. So a bit of before and after. So to the left is the original size. We had a swamp cypress in the middle of this pond, which was quite um, liked by the local community, which caused us a few problems. Um, I will come more to that shortly. But to the right, you can actually see we built a, a bespoke wetland with an, an overland scruffy dome within the actual site. So normally this is how the site looks and how it operates and works well. You can see the, the, the retaining back at, at the far end of the site. So challenges around this project, um, as I say, the swamp cypress um, was a bit of a problem. We underestimated the um, connection between the community and the, the um, the actual tree itself. Um, problem with the with the tree itself was actually was taking up um, probably about a third of the capacity of this pond. So in a significant rain event, we just didn't have the capacity we'd originally designed it for. The tree had grown itself self seeded, and it, to be perfectly honest, had to go. Um, we got consent to do that. We did all been um, formally applied for and consented and communicated to the local board, but um, some of the detail was missed along the 
along the way and caused us a few problems, but we came to the conclusion that it had to go and it has, it subsequently went. Um, we underestimated the amount of silt um, approximately about a thousand cubic meters. Now, it doesn't sound a huge amount, but in a, a pond system of this relatively small size, that thousand cubic meters has proved absolutely vital. And some of the photos later on will actually help you understand how vital. Um, what we didn't expect, and we've it's in both of these projects, is um, that the base of these ponds actually didn't have a formal liner. So what you'd normally expect is either a, a membrane material or a clay lining, um, neither of which were actually present. Um, so we actually ended up removing more more silt and therefore we had to bring in more clay and topsoil to rebuild that well and to make sure wetland to make sure we got the right levels pro, uh, uh, as according as required. Um, a new resource consent was actually required for the dry pan works because we we actually found some of the um, retaining on that site wasn't quite was how we expected it to be. And uh, yeah, we, you never know what these things are like until you actually start to dig. And um, we found that it wasn't quite what we thought it was going to be. So on the 27th of January um, this year, we had a bit of a of a rain event and when I say a bit of a rain event um, I know there's a lot on this I'm just trying to put it into some sort of context the bottom blue line actually speaks to the average rainfall in January here in Auckland so that's you know circa 75 mils of rain per um, per month um, as an event um, the summer average right the way through all of summer so that's from November to at the beginning of March um, is just over 200 and what we actually saw in January was 539 mils um, and that's the largest for 170, ring, uh, 170 years. Um, we had more than twice the previous record month um, and the event on the 27th of January doubled the total amount of rainfall in a single day. There's a full article and there's a link. Again, Barbara will put this in the chat. Um, there's a full link to this article. I'm not professing to be any sort of meteorologist. I do have a station at home and that, you know, what we're seeing here is actually on, on the other side of the harbour. So this is actually south of the bridge. I live within about five kilometres of certainly onto a reserve and at home I, I have a, i'm pretty sad but i i do like to follow the weather and at our on my personal weather station we had 310 millimeters of rain in a single day um that's 12 inches for those more than 12 inches for those in old money and as you can see throughout the day the pressure just continued to drop you know, it dropped 10 HPA um, over the course of that day. And it pretty much consistently rained from about three o'clock in the morning to a major storm event of, at a, at around 5.45 to six o'clock, um, where we saw consistently for the best part of three hours, around 50 millimeters of rain um, per hour, um, which is just, it was, it was crazy. Um, yeah, the flood, roads were flooded and there's a, yeah, Google it, there's a significant number of photos out there. So what happened? So what I've got is a, a number of photos of the actual site. So this is Unsworth Reserve above the site. So there's some playing fields above the actual site. Um, and there, as you can see from the photo on the right there, their silt fence actually failed. And actually, it actually took the retaining wall with it. Um, and that caused a significant amount of flow down down the bank towards the actual pond system itself, which is just refilled with all the silt we've taken out, which will be an interesting question as far as how we look to resolve that going forward. Um, that's the continued flow again, actually at the bottom of the hill and the pond is to the right and the retaining is to the left on the photo on the right. Um, as you can see, the debris in this pond is significant. This is the same pond that, you know, and it's just one rain event. You can see the coloration of the actual water itself, the debris on the scruffy dome, um, all of which has subsequently be cleared and tidied up. Um, the the planting has taken a, bit, a, a significant amount of damage, um, which has actually recovered really well since, but that's what it's meant to do. It, it lays flat and the debris actually comes off. Um, the, all the spillways were actually activated. Um, 
this is the the dry pond at the bottom of the, of the job you can see in the bottom in the middle sorry the photo to the left in the bottom away from the orange orange fencing the actual water level is significantly higher than i've ever seen it prior to this event um there's a bit of scouring which is that photo to the right um which is behind the orange fence and that's why the orange fence is there so it's a significant bit of scouring um what we've got this is back at the top so this is the previous photos we're looking back at this at this this retaining um dam for want of a better phrase and we had a bit of scouring on on the one side um, considering the amount of rain that went through, you know, that's more than twice the amount of rain we've ever experienced here in Auckland in a single day. Um, I'm pretty pleased with how the site has stood up. So that's that's Unsworth Reserve. Titeria is a little bit more complex. Um, this one's actually a stream naturalization. So this is actually putting the kidneys back and taking out a couple of uh, wetland and introducing good fish passage. So again, this is a brown space. Some of you will know brown space. So it's a beautiful beach. Um, um, and this was actually to address a significant water quality issue at that beach. What we were finding was significant fecal contamination and con general contamination coming down the actual catchment onto the beach. And therefore, the, the, the beach was failing its requirements. Um, there's a bit of a concept drawing at the bottom, um, which is what we plan to actually do. Um, we haven't come too far away from that if I'm perfectly honest. So there's a huge amount of opportunities. It's a it's a big catchment and um, a lot of water drains into that. Actually converting a pond to a wetland um, and actually taking out 90 meters of concrete line channel, which is really not very good in a major storm event because all it does is accelerates the water to actually put in a naturalized stream, which actually helps natural um, um retention and actually a, attenuation of the actual of the stream really helps with the ecology of the actual stream itself longer term but it actually really does just slow that water down there's a significant number of um enhancement opportunities which i'm not going to go through but the fish passage and the floodplain connectivity were actually found to be key weren't major parts of what was driving us as i said it was predominantly around water quality at the beach but there was a, a number of other significant um, opportunities within within the project itself. So what was it? So going from bottom left to top right, because that's the the flow. So that's in a northeasterly direction. So the the first section was actually to naturalise the stream. Um, that's the light blue section. So we're taking out concrete channel. We're trying to realign that stream to make sure it allows the the stream to do what it wants to do naturally. Um, there was an existing four bay um you'll see some from some of the photos very shortly that um it wasn't actually functioning as a four bay we actually upgraded that to make sure it was um we actually converted i'm sorry converted a pond into a constructed wetland um, and this is best spoke um it's actually designed for this site um we actually changed the size of what was a pond in, in with the wetland and then we actually daylighted um that 90 meters of pipe work and created some fish passage so we can actually get fish all the way from the coast back up to the top end of the naturalized stream and some of the peripheral advantages of this kind of a project is actually bringing the next generation with us and we went to a lot of trouble to make sure we actually helped and helped the the local community and the local schools particularly um actually work with us and understand what we we're trying to do so the number of schools involved um generally at a very early age so we really educated them in around what that environmental awareness and why we we're doing this what is the ecological significance of this you know people just see it as a as a pond we've actually created something else um and it's actually ecologically significantly better um we have obviously introduced them to construction techniques. Me being an engineer, it's something we're very passionate about. And you know, we're, it's all about inspiring the next generation. There were a number of site visits. We had to take out some significant pine trees. We had, you know, the kids were there while the arborists took those out. We had uh, an opportunity for the kids to sit on the diggers um, and just really embrace that next generation and make sure they understood the, the reasons why it wasn't just a, another construction project digging a hole we're actually doing something for them because this is an intergenerational project they will see the benefit of this more than anybody and their children will see 
equally as much benefit and if we maintain it properly which i have absolutely no reason to doubt we will um actually will deliver a significant development from uh, opportunity for them going forward so getting into the construction so the photo top left is before we started as you can see we've got a lot of iron and manganese in the base of the stream we've got a particularly unattractive bridge um, we've got a very straight concrete line channel so literally there's a 900 millimeter pipe at the top left hand corner of that photo and that's where the, all the water from the catchment above flows into the system um, the bottom left photo is the the process of actually naturalizing that that steep stream bank at the top so we put um retaining either side of the stream we covered it with um on coconut matting which is environmentally friendly so there's no nylon in this so it's ecologically sourced so that actually just breaks down and actually produces um food for the for the planting which is on the bottom right hand photo is actually the finalized site with um with the planting starting to come away is significantly taller than that um we've deliberately created a barrier at this point between the water and the pedestrians because we don't want a fence so we created a natural barrier so the planting is deliberately deliberately tall and dense so people don't want kids wandering in it into it but they, they get a real connection at the bridge and further down which i'll come to shortly so moving down the site, um, this is the four bay. So top left is that four bay. As you can see, it's particularly clogged and choked. Um, I don't know how many, how many of you know what a four bay is, but a four bay is basically designed um, to be an area of a pond that we can actually access that de accelerates the water. So the sediments drop out and they're actually captured here and don't enter the harbour. Um, this was already full. Um, it, it's done its job, it's done its job well, but um, it hadn't been maintained particularly well. And um, so we actually went through that. As you can see, the bottom left hand photo is actually removing all that material, diggers actually into it, um, full protection, full fish removal. So we had an ecologist with this project from start to finish. They actually, we fished this pond, we fished the whole site probably five times overall, because if we have a major storm event, um, our silt fences are designed to fail because you know they're not going to hold all the flow back. But um, what we actually do is go and make sure there are no fish being washed into the site so we don't kill them. And on the right hand side gives you an idea if you can actually start to see the bottom of that pond so that the clarity of that water is significantly improved. And we've actually got a four bay. Um, I'll come to some issues we actually found with the bottom of this four bay um, later on. But um, as you can see, it's a significantly better piece of storage opportunity for water to do its job and actually just slow down and let that sediment drop out. So moving further down the actual project itself. So this is looking back up towards that four bay. So the top left hand photo is um, is a bridge, it's a road bridge, a main road bridge through the site. So that's where the four bay is. And this was the original pond. Um, what we did was take the whole pond out. And as you can actually see from the bottom left hand photo, we've made that deeper again for the eco ecological reasons and extra storage. And we've made the pond sign significantly wider. And this again allows for more storage, that overland flow path, and actually prevent that attenuation to prevent significant rain events hitting Browns Bay and actually slowing some of that water down. And the two photos on the right are actually around the finished product. So this is very early and the planting is starting to come away. It's done well. The, the boardwalk through the center of the through the center of the pond is absolutely gives the whole community that connection to the pond and actually sorry wetland by now. Um, and actually that connection to what the environment is there for and actually you know, people got quite upset that the ducks weren't here anymore. I don't know how many of you know about avian botulism, but it's a major problem. Um, and we actually, you know, it kills thousands of ducks and we have a real problem with that. So this actually is designed to actually let water quality do its job and actually cleans up the system as it goes. So looking back at that pond in the top right hand corner. So this was the original fish passage, which is um, less than ideal. Um, the pipe is, if you can just see in the bottom of the slope, there's a grate. That's where the, if the if the pond overflowed, which it, it, it runs very slowly through, it predominantly was dry most of the summer, but the, any storm event would be required to drop into that grate or wash down. Welcome to further photos of that in shortly. 
So what we did in the bottom left hand photo is create a, a fish passage and there's a there's a good time lapse video. So this is actually as during construction and we've actually it got incremental steps right the way through this fish passage of no more than 50 millimeters to allow the native species of fish to get through. Top right is completion of the project. Um, nice lateralized rock. We brought a huge amount of rock into this job. Um, you know, it, it's actually really it set the site off nicely and actually allowed us to do the job properly. Um, again, with 50 millimeter increments and the planting below. Um, so what you can see below the job is actually so the bottom left hand photo is what the actual project was like. So it's just a, a grassy bank on the way down and the bottom right is actually we actually naturalized that stream and actually introduced fish and shade and meanders and storage and all that wonderful stuff. So oh yeah, sorry, I'd forgotten I got this photo. So top right is again is that actual daylighting of that stream. So literally it was a boggy, horrible mess. Every time it rained significantly, this would um activate as an overland flow path. Um we removed that. The 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 top right photo is that piece of work in process without the planting being put in. And the bottom left hand photo is is actually that planting is in and actually is working well and actually starting to see the clarity of that water increase significantly and actually en enhance the environment. You can see the, the fish flagella is actually now submerged at the bottom of the stream, which is really powerful, making sure that the fish can actually get back up into the system. So challenges for this project. Um, we assumed the four bay, the top pond, was built actually as a four bay and it wasn't. Um, it was just a hole dug. Um, therefore, we underestimated. So again, there was no base. There was no bottom of this pond actually within that. So we underestimated this by 3,000 cubic meters. Circa $1.1 million of um, variation. Um, we had to remove it. Um, otherwise, you know, as I'll come to in the storm event very shortly, um, we wouldn't have the storage to actually do some of, the, some of the things we actually needed to do and actually make sure that site functioned as it should. We had to change project manager during um, during the actual job itself because this was during the COVID-19. So we started this in October 19 and finished it in June 2021. Um, so right the way through COVID, um, number of lockdowns, contractor on site, off site, making it safe. Um, all credit to Glasgow's for their commitment to getting this job done. We had some issues with the local youth in the community um, in as far as we had a digger stolen um, and turned over, uh, which is not a call I, I want and expect all the time, but we did do that. Um, we, we managed to accommodate it. Um, we used a Cyclops security system. Uh, not It's not really a security system. It's given us our time-lapse video. Um, but it really gave us the time, actually, the digger was stolen, so it was really quite useful for that as well. So again, it's it's not the, a single dimension for those kind of time-lapse things. Um, the concrete channel, um, and this is a, a real retrospective learning point for myself personally, um, and I would recommend if you are removing a concrete channel or you are looking to naturalise a stream, if you can, make it work with the concrete remaining where it is, because equally we don't want to tip it. It's it's good where it is, it's doing a good job. We removed the channel at the top here and that resulted because it's um, clay. Um, we had a, a, a significant slip um, and we had to actually remediate that with um, an in-ground wall. So if you're actually doing this, my personal advice is if you can leave the concrete where it is do so because you firstly you're not paying to tip it and secondly you, you may not get a, a, a slip that is um problematic so looking at the time lapse video so i'm going to talk you through some of this but um yeah this is what we did so this was um completed by cyclops right the way through the project so for over two years we had a number of cameras on this site so you'll get various views of the work in progress and i'll talk you through some of that as we go so we start at the top of the job this is the concrete channel we introduce a bit of a meander going left to right. As you can see, we remove the channel itself, introduce the, the, the bagging to the side, all um, surfaces are covered. Again, we now add the bank to the right. 
made the actual profile of the, the stream wider, which was great. Um, coconut lighting, as I said, concrete path going in on the top right hand side, which is a nice amenity. Now we've dropped down to the four bay, we're starting to bring that concrete path through. Again, adding that amenity to the local community. Four bays already cleared by now. Actually working as it should now. We're actually at the fish passage looking up towards Browns Bay. The excavation's been done for the deeper channel there. The fish passage is starting to go in at the bottom of the screen. As you can see, that grate in the middle, that's where the water used to go. So that's the pipework itself. Um, had to be really clever here because the, the existing fish passage couldn't accept much load. So we had to be very conscious of the weight of the new fish passage going on top of that and making sure it wasn't ever. So we actually used a, a special product in the bottom of the actual concrete fish pass channel. Um, water going in for the first time, bit of reinforcing. Um, it was scorching hot summer. So this is right the way through the drought as well, which is something else we had in Auckland for a while. Um, starting to see, this is the pond. So this is, a, it's got the floating wetland in it as we speak. Um, that, so that you can see the same dredger was in the pond itself. It's back again, taking more silt out. So the, the, there's a number of bins on the right hand side to actually support, that's where the silt goes. And you can see that the footprint of that is almost doubled. Um, deep water channels starting to be dug, digging out that base. Deep, deep water's introduced again, topsoil going in. Base for the boardwalks coming in, planting's been done. This is all in a live working system as we speak. New concrete paths gone in at the bottom. That's linking to the boardwalk boardwalk links through we've got an access track going in on the left hand side to allow access to the far end of that fish passage that will be removed and this is the actual final job so this is a time lapse video after so that's looking at the wetland itself so this is about eight months after so we're back at the top end of the project flying through the streams really coming away nicely a new bridge has gone in so the iron and manganese is, is still there but nowhere near as prevalent boardwalks in the viewing platform we put in some pieces of pipe on the left hand side that actually were removed from the base of the stream which is cool and that naturalized stream is actually been put in so this is the four bay is actually doing its job it actually we can store you know up to 500 cubic meters of water there which is great fish passage working planting coming away nicely boardwork functioning um it's really well well what the community has taken. So there's now a park run at this site, which is absolutely great. And um, they, they just didn't do this before. So it's um, a major, a major improvement for the local community that, you know, these are things that we just didn't build into the business case, but are absolutely there for everyone to see. Oops, no, I didn't want to do that. Let's do that. So what happened on the 27th of January? Now, some of you will actually know Browns Bay did get flooded um there were problems in the site but i can sit here hand on heart and absolutely say if we hadn't have done the work we did at this site it would have been significantly worse we were able to um attenuate significant amounts of water at this site it's not an excuse it's, it wasn't perfect but equally that was an event we've never seen the likes of before um it was designed for a, a one in ten, 10 year event not a one in probably a 250 year event um i have no confirmation of that and that's just me estimating but um yeah it was a significant rain event as already said you know at my place we had 310 millimeters of rain in a 24 hour period so what did we see again significant amounts of brush washed through the site itself um this washed up onto the boardwalk i'm led to believe the only part of the boardwalk was that was visible was the top handrail. So it gives you an idea of the amount of water that was came through this site. In the bottom right hand photo, you can actually see the reeds have actually been washed through up into that top rail. So that you know, this the boardwalk itself is 300 mil above the water level. So that's another six, so that's nearly a meter um above. And just, that's how the amount of water that's gone through this site. Um, again, more debris, um, 
things were just picked up out of gardens and washed through the site. Um, it's all been it's being cleaned up as we speak, but the clarity is coming back in the water. It's looking like it's starting to do the job. Um, so bottom left, sorry, top left, you can actually see some of the scouring. So some of the rock has actually been moved and removed. Um, and the bare clay's actually been exposed. We were hoping to do a bit of a site visit, but um, this stuff's got to be repaired and I wasn't sure around the Healthy Walkers timeline. So we actually canceled that. So apologies for that. But if you ever want to go for a little walk in off Glencoe Road in Browns Bay, you're more than welcome to. Um, and you can actually see this for yourself. The bottom right hand photo is actually the fist passage. And you can see a significant amount of rock has been removed from, from that and actually washed downstream. Um, you can see the grass has been flattened, um, but that's what they're designed to do. They've all popped back up now. They're actually doing a really nice job and just, you know, continue to clarify that water and actually get you know, Browns Bay Beach back to how it should be. Again, more aspects of the same area. So you can see the gravels that have been washed out in the, in the middle of the photo and at the top, just above the fish passage itself, you can see that scouring is quite significant. So there's going to need to be a significant amount of rock brought either back from further down the stream or actually new rock brought in. Um, you'll see some of the further consequences downstream shortly. That's a root wad. Um, a root wad is a, basically a tree stump of that is placed up until the root. So you actually turn the tree upside down and you bury and concrete, sorry, excuse me, concrete in two thirds of that piece of tree and the, the roots or was the, were the roots of the tree actually um, provide shelter and ecology and all sorts of brilliant shade for, for invertebrates and fish. Well, that was 30 meters back up towards the fish passage and it's just been literally lifted up and moved down. You can see the grass has been flattened, the, the rocks have been buried. You know, there's a significant amount of work to do in the top left hand photo. Top right, similar, similar story again. Grass is not flat, but that, again, that's what they were designed to do. But it's, you can see a, a huge amount of water has gone through this site. And the, this is the very bottom fish passage. Um, again, good clarity is starting to come back, but there's significant damage on the near at the bottom of the photo. Um, again, that's just stripping of um, the planting and um, the, the protective mats that were actually placed into that. And just looking back upstream, as you can see, it's a it's a still a, a good functioning stream with a few few patches of um, planting removed and issues around that. But um, all in all, this site has actually stood up particularly well. Um, that's all I have. Um, any questions, comments, views? I think we've got. Uh, two questions, Peter, in the Q and A. Cool. Uh, first one by Riaz. Uh, can you kindly compare Safe Swim to other programs available in industry, such as Hecras? I know Others? nothing of any other product. It's not my speciality, so sorry, okay. but no. Um, yeah, I can put you in contact with people that do, um, but no, that is not my my speciality. We just were required to try and improve the. the the quality of the harbour that actually allow them to do the job. Um, I'm led to believe it's industry leading. It does a great job. It's certainly allowed significant amount of investment in Auckland. Um, for those of you who don't know, we've got a targeted rate around water quality. And what Safe Swim has allowed us to do is actually scientifically prove that there was a problem that needed to be fixed. Um, we're now starting to realise it's all very apparent, you know, but it was when it was created, nearly eight years ago, this was cutting edge. It was something very different. It was actually about convincing the politicians and the people that actually want to do this work that there, there was a problem. Um, it did that. Um, we've moved on now, I'm afraid, but um, it's, yeah. No, I cannot, can't comment, but if if you want more detail, I can actually happily, happily provide it with the context of people that do it. Yeah. And then the second question was uh, from Martin Evans. Um, in the Unsworth site, what was a four bay to capture sediment used? Yeah. Um, um, not formally. The... No, okay. we didn't because the catchment above Unsworth is significantly smaller. Um, part of the pond, so that that um, damage that did fail, um, 
that is actually where we will look to capture that sediment. Um, and that, that we've now created an access way at that top end. So there is there is a, a naturalized four bay, but not a formal one in the same way as Titia. Um, and that's down to the size of the actual catchment itself. There's a there's a further smaller dam above it that we didn't actually do any work on. That it, that's what that does. Um, but we didn't actually work on that because that has already been maintained fairly recently prior to what we were doing or how we were doing it. And um, the second part of the question was, what was there a design basis for the size of sediment particles to be captured? Don't know off the top of my head, sorry. Um, just, no, I can find out, um, but I, yeah, okay. no, um, I'm just a dumb engineer that tried to build it. Um, I have a question. Um, cool. in, in terms of um, Temana or Te um, yeah. I mean, I, when I look at um, the project that you've outlined, um, it, it re really does resonate with priority one, which is um, the health and well-being of water bodies. And, and you're, Absolutely. you know, the project is trying to bring that back. Yeah. Um, was that ever considered um, at, at the forefront or, or um, as part of bringing in, um, you know, the, 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 the Timana Te uh, principles or, or It wasn't spoken to as part of the original objectives. Um, mm -hmm. The reason I'm involved with Siwim, I'm, I'm an engineer, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm, I build structures, I build, the reason these kind of projects really interested me was exactly around that and that intergenerational view. Now you can put whatever branding you would like on that, but that that intergenerational result. So you know, I'm from the Midlands of the UK where, you know, I learned to kayak in the canals in the mid eighties. Now, any of you know anything about the canals of the UK in the mid eighties, they were not particularly pleasant, but we went through a lot of, development to actually enhance the environment and actually improve that water quality and that's stayed with me now mm. the fact that this actually links back to the maori perspective and that intergenerational view is spectacular and it, you know for me Simon needs to align more with that and modern engineering needs to align more than that we've got to listen to nature you know i'm mm. one of my biggest frustrations as sponsor to so this was these weren't the only you know stream enhancement projects i worked on um my biggest frustration was engineers wanted to engineer a solution and not actually work with the environment. So I had a, a similar project up on uh, Funga Proa um, where we naturalized about two kilometers of what was pipe work and actually put a stream in. And the original design was a beautiful serpentine flow, but it didn't mm. actually understand the, the contour of the land. It didn't actually connect to the community didn't connect to the land or the intergenerational benefit i actually brought so you know the, the contractors and that was glasgow's again they were actually trying to build it to this and they were saying well this water's not going to go this way so we'll stop digging it then actually listen to the land and thankfully you know the beauty of Glasgow's and I, I genuinely I am absolutely astounded at their attitude to wanting to learn and grow but that actually allowed that job to you know the, the proper meanders because the, there was a stream there um at some point we buried it and we actually actually went back to that and so actually making sure we do more of that so Timata OTY for me is the core of everything we need to do and it's great that it's actually into the legislation it actually it allows us to talk about it um you know, I'm a chartered environmentalist. Um, and I'm passionate about the environment. Um, it's only in recent years I've actually been comfortable saying that. You know, you say that <laughs> in an engineering community, you're, you're like an alien. You know, you might always have three heads. It's 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 nuts actually. But we actually see from two projects you know, I've demonstrated tonight that if you do that, it can actually work. And I'm not saying the solution for Browns Bay was perfect, um, mm. but it was significantly better because of the work we did. And you know people who browns may, may or may not agree with me and I, i'll i'll take that as it comes but i know we took you know the best part of five thousand cubic meters of material out which allowed five thousand cubic meters of water to be there for significantly longer than it would have been previously which can only have helped so no it's um it's not a perfect world we do the best we can and yeah working with tomato ty is phenomenal i think the more of that we do the better we get at that the better we start to align to that 
the better results we will see all around and the more of this kind of stuff you know there's significant talk now of um sponge city and this mm. you know we've been doing this for you know healthy water's been doing this mm. for the best part i said um the oakley creek project tianga um that's you know was a bigger version of this this was the bigger contract bigger contractor and that again performed really well in this event because it allowed this the, the stream to be a stream not an engineered solution you know mm -hmm. we'd have washed bridges away if they hadn't have done that work in that area because they got particularly hard hit as well yeah and we're beginning to see that even singapore has gone that way yeah. of uh, naturalizing canals yeah um got another question from nikki wood um again thank you for thanking you for a great little presentation and um a non-techie question which other regional councils are involved with safe swim i don't know enough about safe swim to be able to, i know the the waikato has got some and i think tauranga might have some involvement but i'm i'm not the person to ask about safe swim i can so I'll, i can point you to people to the right team um at healthy waters i'm actually no longer at healthy waters i've been there for over a year but um these projects I felt needed to be shared. I think people can learn from this and actually the more of this we can do, especially with the, the recent weather events, um, it won't have solved the problems, but it will have helped if we'd have done more of this 20 years ago. Another question here. Um, great presentation, Pete. Do you have any tips on what we can do as project managers to encourage more mono Fenoir influence in our work? as in more collaboration? For me, it's about just being honest from the word go and actually being transparent about what we're trying to achieve. This, this was easy, you know, that taking this into the schools and actually working with the Manifeno around that, what it means for the next generation. Um, the Maori world worldview is actually more about how it's affected our forefathers and how it will affect the generations to come and actually thinking about that and actually working with them they've got some great ideas they've got some wonderful experiences and i think the more of that we can do the better um my personal view is embrace it um once you get you know this is i'm, I'm an incomer you know I've, I've been in new zealand for 17 years i'm, I'm a white middle class male i am i am not the, the desired people to actually communicate with but if they see your passion for this and they see your understanding of what we're trying to achieve and the willingness to work with with the land and the people i think you, that alignment will actually help you a long way these you know the our biggest problem was the people like me you know that didn't want change you know the swamp cypress it, it's a weed it, it shouldn't have been there the fight, and I, I almost mean physical fight, it ended up at um, because some people didn't want it removed and couldn't see the, the bigger picture and the benefit of what we're actually trying to achieve was terrifying. And if these people were so passionate about actually the results we've actually got and the benefit that has now actually delivered, with well, our lives as engineers and project managers will be significantly easier. And I think working with Manafena were to do that and you know I'd work with Heap and um, Hapu and Iwi too and actually bring those generations in and actually you know actually take it through and actually Tiang is another again another great example of joining communities um actually linking communities you know a number of bridges went in down there to actually deal with some of these specific issues and actually the more you embrace it the better um is my yeah go open Go honestly is is my absolute advice. Don't don't try and hide behind technical. I'm yeah. I'm, I get tired of people telling me it's, it can't be done. Well, I'm, if I can do it, anybody can do it. It's it's about being honest and transparent and learning. You know, we didn't get this right. You know, we yeah. made mistakes. You know, there were big variations in this job. I had to go to a director of Auckland Council twice, but over a million half of variations for the same issue. Um, not something I ever want to do again, I can assure you, but we have, I've learned from it. Um, I won't make that mistake again. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look like I, we've got any more questions. I've, I've got a question for you, Pete. Go on, Barbara. With the um, ecology, with the, the studies that have been done, uh, is that going to be continued to be monitored? And is that yes. 
that's no. a, an opportunity as well to involve yeah, the public exactly. and have citizen science. Uh, we actually, it's part of our resource consent. So we have a, a legislative requirement to actually monitor the water quality of this site for five years post the event. Mm -hmm. So we'll actually get that as a, a set of data as well. So it's actually a legal requirement. We also already monitor at Browns Bay. So we have regular sampling at the beach. So we'll actually start to see if this starts to fail at the beach first, because that's where it will fail. And actually, so now we've got next, well, it's now the next three years and we've had two years worth of data post post the project. Um, and then we've got three more years of monitoring of that. It's, it's probably quarterly monitoring from memory, but the beach I'm assuming with Safe Swim and what that is actually bringing to the community will continue well beyond that. That's really interesting talk. And it's, it's as you say, working with nature because well, nature's yeah. been doing it for a lot longer than we. Precisely, <laughs> and yeah. There are elements we can help, you know, we brought rock in, you know, um, that could be a certainly um, high tier, so shield reserve, could be a, a stream on the South Island. You know, if you, I've got photos, if you could quite easily compare it to anything around Glen Orkey, you know, that's central South Island, um, but it's not, it's, it's in a reserve in the middle of an urban environment and, and it's doing a great job on all camps. And did you have a Watch lot it? of... Not non-native non plants that invasive were invasive in that area. Or... Yeah, so all our planting had to be native, um, and we chose particular shade-bearing plants, and certainly that the tall grasses in the wetlands. So these are all native plants, and they do a great job. They're designed for this environment. Again, people get really hung up on that they want a specific species. It doesn't need to be. It just needs to do the job and do the job well. If it does that, you can see in the, you know, a major storm event, it, it performs. Yeah, there's a bit of you know debris from it, but um, yeah, they're all native. They all did a fantastic job, and I think it's fear. And that's the bit that frustrates me personally. There's nothing to be scared of. You know, people want to do the right thing. You know, the, the reason Manafena and Iwi and Harpu are actually involved is they want to do the right thing. I think we get lost in, we're slowing a project down or we're making it harder or we're adding cost. It's not about that. It's about doing the job properly. And the more we can do the job properly once, you know, the, the maintenance that these two sites post the event I was really quite surprised how little impact there has been. And some of that might have been down to our dumb Western engineering and actually do, not just bedding it properly. And it may be as simple as that, but I haven't you know, looked at what the reports have said post, but we need to listen and learn and go with the environment, not work against it. Oh, we've got somebody who's got a question. I do. Would, would you like to ask a question or oh no they, they put their hand again down hand again now. Oh. oh good. Well thank you, Pete. I think that's a really been a really interesting talk. And um as you say, it's it's an ongoing project. It's it's a sort of living project, isn't it? So um yeah. in, in in more words words than one. So cool. um, I'd like to really thank you for for, for the first of your um, presentations um, and events from uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, I look forward to, to some following ones. Cool. Thanks all. Okay. Thanks all. So, take care now. Bye. Okay.